Hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Zia, a clinical psychologist specializing in transgender care. Welcome to my channel. Today, I want to discuss with you a vicious cycle. Yes, I call it a vicious nasty cycle that a lot of you are finding yourself in that makes you feel and continues to perpetuate feelings of being stuck. And not only does it perpetuate being or feelings of feeling stuck, it literally perpetuates you being stuck in the same place. A lot of you may be familiar with the cycle. A lot of you want to explain what the cycle is, may have an aha moment and awareness that holy shit, this is the cycle that I actually do recognize in my life. And hopefully by recognizing it, it will give you a nudge to do something about it. Uh, the cycle occurs to individuals who feel in dysphoria, regardless whether you are in transition, regardless whether you started transition, whether you want to transition, whether you don't want to transition. The cycle has to do with one thing and one thing only, and that is dysphoria and coping mechanisms you employ in order to deal with dysphoria and how those coping mechanisms breed certain psychological elements or ailments in this case, and how those ailments further uh, perpetuate you being stuck in the same position. Uh, I see this vicious cycle in so many adults, so many adults. I got to the point where, uh, believe it or not, reading some of your comments and the way people explain and describe their situations, I am able to spot cycles in some of those narratives. Um, uh, it just became one of the cycles that I recognized again and again. And I can just see how it just continues to keep a lot of you stuck. And I really don't want any of you to feel stuck. This is not about whether you want to transition or not, whether it is for you or not. There's still other things you can do in order to cope with gender dysphoria. Again, just by talking to somebody in your geographic area can help tremendously. Because remember, you're keeping, if you're conscious that you have dysphoria and you're keeping it all to yourself, that's a very big thing to keep to yourself. As human beings, we're not meant to keep things to ourselves. Uh, we're just, by nature, social beings, we want to let everybody in or we want to share things. So I know for a fact, it's very difficult to keep things to yourself. So just by even talking to anybody and letting somebody in on what it is that you're struggling with is tremendously helpful. Having said that, now let's discuss this vicious cycle and what does the cycle look like. Like I said, it has to do with dysphoria. Quickly, let's revisit dysphoria. Dysphoria is, remember, a distress signal. Dysphoria is a symptom, just like when you have um, a stomachache. A stomachache is distress signal. It's a distress signal that something is going on. Maybe you ate something. Maybe something going on in your stomach lining. Maybe something is going on in your gastronomical tract. It's still a distress signal. Just what is that distress signal? It's your body. It is your psyche. It is your, your whole being uh, placing a phone call to you, to your conscious self, to let you know something is going on here. In this case, just what is a distress signal? It's a phone call hoping that you will pick up on the other end where it will tell you, hey, your gender is not something you're comfortable with. Hey, there's something in disalignment in regards to gender assigned at birth. Again, that disalignment could mean a lot of things. Remember, dysphoria can be social, can be physical. There's a lot of elements to dysphoria. And not everybody who feels dysphoria necessarily needs to transition. Not everybody who feels dysphoria necessarily also just identifies as transgender. Dysphoria could have something to do with uh, social elements and how you're being perceived and just you maybe changing uh, some of your expression, your gender expression, or your gender role without going through those big changes. But regardless, whatever it is, this worry is a distress signal. It's a phone call that yourself, your body, you, you know, your deeper part of yourself, the core part of yourself that knows who you are is placing to your conscious ego self so that something can actually happen. So when you pick up that phone call and you realize you have dysphoria, like a lot of you have, uh, and you realize you're struggling with dysphoria, you start questioning your gender. Now, I know a lot of you know your trends. A lot of you are still wondering if you are transgender. A lot of you wondering how much of this has to do with your gender expression or maybe just gender role. Uh, maybe uh, you just have some kind of inclination or some kind of leaning toward gender bending. Regardless you start wondering, you start questioning yourself. 
And the first thing that we do as human beings when we feel distrust signal in ourselves is we run for a medicine. We run for that which will make us feel better. In the case of stomach ache, it might be an antiacid pill. Uh, and if that doesn't help, it might be something else, right? When we have migraine or headache, we run toward Advil or uh, um, Tylenol. What I'm trying to say is that we navigate toward coping. When dysphoria sends you a distress signal, the way that we as human beings cope, because some of us recognize that one of the ways that people do cope with it, if it's severe enough, is transition, but it's scary and it's overwhelming and it's too much to bear and too much to think about initially. So what we do is we take a step back. And for a lot of you, step back means coping in a lot of different ways. And because dysphoria is something that we're not, a lot of you are not given healthy tools to cope with it. We seldom actually, this is a mistake of myself included, medical providers and psychological providers who talk about dysphoria, we talk about the issues it causes and transition, but we seldom talk about other healthier coping uh, tools, and I should do a video about it, how to cope with it. So for a lot of you who get the distress signal, you start just kind of figuring out what would help you cope. A lot of it is blind coping, meaning you just try it and see if it works. Some of those copings are very unhealthy. You know what they are. Some of you start drinking. You drink, you come home after work, just 40 hits you because now you have time to yourself. You start thinking about it and you don't want to feel it. You don't want to think about it. You don't want to confront it. You don't want to deal with it. You don't want to realize what you may have to do about it or how your life going to have to change if you have to do anything about it. So you have a drink. When you have a drink, you notice that you forget about it. It allows you temporarily to avoid feeling dysphoria. Drugs, another common one. Some kind of self-harm, God forbid, is another one. Not healthy ways of coping. Overeating is also not a healthy overcoping. Undereating is not a healthy coping. But with human beings, we don't like to be in pain. So we look for that that will help us avoid pain, that will ease our suffering. Remember, like Freud said, and Freud wasn't wrong, by the way, as human beings, we try to seek pleasure and try to minimize and avoid pain. So you try to avoid that pain. And if it's a negative coping that you picked up, and if it helps to avoid pain, you will stick to it because you have shown to yourself that it works. And you will disregard the fact that it's a negative coping because to you, the most negative things right now you're trying to control is your dysphoria. There are, of course, a lot of you who will gravitate towards a different kind of coping. So, for example, some of you have a little bit more healthier coping. Maybe you will uh, put your sneakers on and you go out there and you try to run off the anxiety that you feel in relation to dysphoria. Maybe a lot of you will uh, do something else. Maybe some of you will sit down and put on some some kind of a binge worthy TV and try to escape from feeling just 40 by watching and losing yourself and avoiding confronting it. Some of you have healthier coping mechanisms. Maybe you sit down and you journal about how you're feeling and you write about it. Maybe you talk to somebody about it. Maybe you take a hot bath and you try to self-soothe. Regardless of the copings that all of you try to employ, what happens is this, this is how you create the vicious cycle. Dysphoria starts, you feel distrust, it's uncomfortable and you're not ready to do anything about it. Whether it is again, you realize you want to transition or for a lot of you, it could be just simple as, oh, oh I got to start exploring my gender or I got to go and maybe modify my gender expression. Nothing really drastic, but huge. But for you, it may feel drastic and huge, depending on your circumstances and the context and environment you find you in, the family you find you in, and all those things play a role. So dysphoria, you get the stress signal, it hurts. Because it hurts, you then gravitate toward healthy or unhealthy or moderately healthy strategies to cope. Whatever is maybe within your reach, or maybe as a human being, whatever you got accustomed to coping. Some people have got accustomed to emotional eating. Every time they feel distressed, they will emotional eat. You will most likely gravitate toward eating if that's your coping. Some of you got accustomed to drinking. You will drink. Some of you have accustomed to working yourself to death. So you'll throw yourself into work regardless. So you gravitate toward coping. You start coping. 
So you start copying, and this is the cycle and pattern that happens. You start copying, and you just worry the noise and distress and the pain of your AWI starts to decrease a little bit. Because coping helps. Because coping helps by avoidance. All of those coping have one thing in common. It is avoidance of who you are and avoidance of taking steps, actionable steps toward your future. So you start coping and you just worry starts to go a little bit quieter, right? And what you tell yourself is this, look, this is working. Look, while this has not completely gone away, I've been able to control it. Wow, I got, I was able to put a leash on it. You know, this worry is like a puppy. It just, it's like a, puppy that wants to go in all different directions and suddenly you found a way to put a leash on it but you don't realize that the leash you put on it is one of those what do you call them um retraceable leashes that allow puppy to wander and give puppy lots of territory and even though you're still within the puppy still within your control it still has room to roam it's the puppy still there the puppy hasn't gone anywhere at all in fact the only thing you're doing is really controlling how far it can go uh, and how further out or uh, closer in it can go this is how badly i know about uh, one of the slishes and when freud was alive and we never had those slishes because anyway long story so getting back to this you telling yourself hey look at this i can control this puppy i can put a leash on it because you are able to put a leash on it temporarily that makes you feel empowered. It makes you feel like you're doing something about this, you see? And because you feel like you're doing something about it, you also actually, without realizing it, are creating another coping denial that you're managing it, which is really all you're doing. Again, you're keeping the pipe analyst. Remember, the pipe is still there. So while this is this worry goes a little bit down, remember it, it doesn't go completely away, but it goes a little bit down, right? You're able to at least control it. when you come home and it's overwhelming, you put a leash on it by drinking, by over exercising, by watching something, by avoiding, you quiet it down a little bit. What you don't realize is that you're spending so much energy quieting it down. But because it's still there, but it's quieter, other things in your life start to go up. For example, because you're still not dealing with dysphoria, your health is still suffering because you're still, even subconsciously, under tremendous amount of stress. Because this is over here, your relationships suffer because you're still not sharing and you're still not out to anybody around you. You're keeping this all to yourself. You're not really living authentic you. Your productivity suffers. Okay, your relationship to yourself suffers. So think about anything else in your life. Even you have other symptoms going on, other issues going on, tends to suffer too. So keep in mind, as you're coping and you're telling yourself you're managing this, what in fact you're doing is pushing this a little bit down. But by pushing this down, this over here continues to still go up just like it would. So what I'm trying to say is that by changing this, it's not like your environment has suddenly drastically changed to the point where uh, you're recognizing this has also got improvement as a result of you managing this. No. If you think this over here got improvement because you're managing this, you're in denial. Or in the very least, you're really fooling yourself. And I think you deserve better than that, okay? What you're really doing is you're controlling this. So the, this AWI hurts a little bit less but it's still affecting all of those domains in your life over here. Whatever your domains are, relationship to your kids, relationship to yourself, relationship to your partner, um, things you really want to do, relationship to your body, how you feel about yourself, your confidence, your self-esteem, your depression, your anxiety, everything else. So that's the cycle. This is how cycle starts and this is how it perpetuates. It perpetuates itself because all of this, as it goes up, while well, this is, you're just pressing on it, and all of this goes up, and because this is, continues to suffer more and more and more, you start feeling, as a result of it, depressed. It's inevitable that as human beings, we're not going to get depressed uh, when things are going badly in our lives. Of course, we're going to get depressed. So are you. You're getting more depressed and maybe even more anxious um, and more upset and just feel hopeless and helpless. Why? Because this is slowly going up and up and it disrupts your life. And you start to wonder, why is it disrupting my life and I'm managing it so well? 
Well, you're really not mentioning it because remember the pipe is still yapping over here and you're just putting a lid on it. So the vicious cycle lies in the fact that when you start feeling depressed, you start feeling, you get into a depressive mindset of glass half empty. You get into a depressive mindset of nothing is ever going to work out for me. Uh, nothing will ever pan out for me. This will never um have any promises for me uh there's no way to deal with it there's no way to feel better there's no way to feel healthier so you become even more hopeless and helpless about taking any kind of steps and because you're feeling depressed you start immediately linking it to to uh, dysphoria which is in some way true and you start telling yourself that dysphoria is debilitating you to the point where you can't even do anything about it what you need to realize is that, yes, the dysphoria is there, the puppy is there, but because you have created a coping and you have also convinced yourself that you're controlling it and you're managing it, it's actually making things much, much more worse for you. Because you're not really controlling it. You think you are, but it's an illusion. It's still there and it's not going away. And it's going to stay that way. And while it's staying that way, it is destroying everything over here. And that's what we don't want. We don't want to destroy everything over here because the more the healthier and the more robust things you have over here, the higher are your chances of actually dealing with this worry. Why? Think about your relationship. If your relationship is really good and solid, at the moment you start feeling dysphoria, you have better chance of relationship working out as you decide to do anything about your gender. Versus while you're trying to manage this right here or, or convincing yourself that you're managing this, your relationship is suffering. And then it gets to the point when you're ready to do something about it, your relationship has eroded. And at that point, your relationship dissolves and then you end up being all by yourself. The most painful thing to recognize about the vicious cycle the most painful painful things to recognize about it and i hate to be the bad guy to point it out to a lot of you is that you are the ones if you're engaging in the cycle you are the ones you are the ones who are creating it unfortunately you are the ones who are creating this vicious cycle by believing you're managing dysphoria by believing that the coping you employ are helping you. And it may feel like it's helping. And sometimes coping is good for a very short period of time. But I want you to ask yourself, if you've been managing this for, I would say, longer than three years, even three years is a long time, okay? For longer than three years, and I know that a lot of you have been managing this for decades, decades, that is not managing. That is not managing. And what also happens is whatever you employed as coping eventually also stops exercising its power over this. If drinking used to help sometimes, drinking no longer helps. So then what do you got to do? Drink more? No, then you got to do something more drastic. So I hate to point this out, but a lot of times we do things to ourselves and we don't even realize. We create cycles within ourselves we don't realize. We tell ourselves we're doing things that are actually helping us when they're not helping us. They're making things even worse. And this is one of those case scenarios. This is unfortunately one of those case scenarios that once you realize that this is distress signals that should not be put on a leash, but should be addressed, all of this starts to get better. You know this. How many of you, once you addressed your dysphoria and started to do something about it, suddenly lost the weight or started to lose weight you gained by overeating over here uh sobered up uh took care of your body took care of your health suddenly your depression went down suddenly your anxiety went down why because you started to take care of this why is it that we are our worst enemies and i know that thinking about dealing with this what is so difficult and challenging but in this case it is so vital and important to your overall well-being so why is it that a lot of you continue to be your own worst enemies now i want to be very clear that by dealing with this it doesn't mean you have to jump all the way into the things that terrify you again tradition may or may not be for you 
transition is not mandatory and it's not for everybody. I don't know how many times I have to say this. It's not mandatory and it's not for everybody because some people still uh, feel like I'm only preaching transition, which is not true. There could be a lot of things going on with your dysphoria. Why dysphoria is nagging at you? It could be just a matter of you talking to somebody about it. It could be a matter of you recognizing and accepting it. It could be a matter of you no longer avoiding it, but confronting it and saying, okay, I'm not ready to do anything about you. You're calling me, I hear you. But I'm confronting this. I'm not comfortable with my gender. I'm not going to avoid it. It could be something as simple as exploring and maybe just stepping more into the gender domain you're comfortable with without medical or surgical interventions. And for some of you, yes, it may be medical and surgical transition. And that is okay too. But you remember, you can and have power to decide what is appropriate for you. There's lots of adults I work with who are older, who are older, who tell me, I really want to have all the surgeries but I don't think it's going to be worth it for me at this point in my life. And we do little minimal steps they can to deal with this. So it doesn't pain. So it doesn't ache so much. And that's okay too. That is okay too. You have to decide what's best for you. You really do. So remember, it doesn't have to be giant leaps. I think what scares a lot of people when they think about dysphoria is what they see in the social media and what they hear about is that dysphoria automatically equals I'm trans, that automatically equals I need to transition, that automatically equals all of the surgeries, and that automatically equals losing everybody around me. And that while could be the case for some of you who want to go through all of the steps, it doesn't have to be the case for everybody else. Especially the younger you are, the more options you actually have, the more nuances you have to express and to connect to your gender. So this is a cycle. It's a vicious, nasty, nasty cycle. I hate the cycle. It breaks my heart. And it really, really, I almost wanted to say it angers me, but it's really your life. But it upsets me when I see in the comments and I can spot the vicious cycle because sometimes I just want to shake some of you and just say, do something about it. Again, it doesn't have to be giant. What's happening is a lot of people are terrified because they think if they do something about it, that will open up a door to doing everything about it. Well, here's the thing, guys. If it's going to open up a door to doing everything about it, that means inside of you, that's the door that needed to be opened. And for some of you, that will be the case. And for some of you, that won't be the case. But it's already in you and you cannot keep it shut forever. When we keep things shut that need to be improved, that need to come out, that need to be expressed, our everything about us, this is how we humans wired, sends a distress signal. Aren't you tired of hearing the distress signal going on and on and on and on no matter what you do? So this is the vicious cycle you want to avoid. You want to avoid it because you have to be careful about your coping. You have to ask yourself how long you've been coping. And you have to recognize that even coping while keeping this up, still bringing and making all of these other areas of your life go up in terms of destruction. And you don't want that to happen because I'm sure whatever you have over here is something all of you worked very hard for and you don't want to lose it. And you don't want to damage it and you don't want that to be subject of destruction. So comment below, let me know how many of you are realizing you are in this vicious cycle. How many of you just realized you are in this vicious cycle? What are you willing to do about it? What are the first steps? The first steps could be something so small. It could be reaching out to online terms. It could be today in the comment section, writing down and saying, this is the first time I'm vocalizing out loud to anybody here to read and hear in the comment section that I'm struggling with this that I have just 40 and I'm scared shitless to do something about it. It could be something as simple as that. Do that because everybody, remember, this is starting to really become uh, a community. It's starting to become a hub, if you will, where each one of you are sharing and commenting and discussing things. And there's invaluable, invaluable information in comments alone from people who've been there, from people who've been in your shoes. There's so many people watching this who... Uh, Probably, I mean, don't even, I, I know all of you because you've been commenting, I've been reading your comments since this channel has been born. Some of you are watching this and I know you're so past, you're like done. 
You don't need to hear this. I'm not talking to you, but you watch this perhaps because it helps you feel affirmed. It helps you feel valid. It helps you recognize that, oh, that's right. This is what I was going through. And you've been there. And I think what's beautiful about those people that have been there is that you are now commenting. And I see this under other comments. And you're saying, I know. I've been there. It gets better. When you take the first step, it gets better. So comment below. Share below. As always, I read everybody's comments. And hopefully, hopefully, we let you start breaking this, this nasty vicious cycle. Because it's so painful. And it's not sustainable. It is not sustainable coping with dysphoria is not sustainable unless it is so ridiculously mild for a lot of you it is not so comment below let me know and i'll see you all next time bye